I contain multitudes. If you were to do a little internet search of that line, most likely the first series of web pages will be about a song written and released by Bob Dylan in the spring of 2020. You are a good man. I take back what I said about you. A song written and released by Bob Dylan in the spring of 2020, just weeks into the COVID-19 pandemic. The album, Bob Dylan's 39th, is entitled Rough and Rowdy Ways, and it was a complete shock even for we die-hard Dylan fans. No one saw it coming. And the real work of art on that album is a song entitled Murder Most Foul. It is as epic as Bob Dylan ever gets, even now in his 80s. A 17-minute ballad commemorating the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It's a masterpiece of Americana music. But back to I Contain Multitudes. Bob Dylan has always been fascinated with the multiple characters living inside of him. To my knowledge, he doesn't have multiple personality disorder. But he makes observation of the obvious. We all have these different characters existing within us. He said, I change during the course of the day. I wake up and I'm one person and when I go to sleep I know for certain I'm somebody else. I don't even know who I am most of the time. And it doesn't even seem to matter. And this isn't original to Dylan or to any popular artist. The phrase, I contain multitudes, doesn't even belong to Bob Dylan. He borrowed it. I would say stole it. He borrowed it. Do that internet search. Sort through a couple pages of results, and you will ultimately come up on a poem written by the great Walt Whitman. It's called Song of Myself. It was written over the course of two years, 1891 and 1892. And if you want to talk about epic, this poem is more than 15,000 words long, has 52 stanzas, and takes up about 30 printed pages in standard type. It's a single poem, a poem that in stanza 51 has that line, I contain multitudes. I'm not going to analyze that poem. I haven't done that since undergrad, and I'm not interested in doing it anymore. But I will quote bits of it that speak to the fragmentation we all feel, and I have it here for you to follow along. Whitman says, I know that all the men ever born are also my brothers. And the women, my sisters and lovers. And that the keelson of creation is love. What do you think has become of the young and old men? And do you think, and what do you think has become of the women and the children? They are alive and well somewhere. There is really no death. All goes onward and outward. I am old and I am young. Of the foolish as much as the wise, maternal as well as paternal, a child as well as a man, stuffed with the stuff that is coarse and stuffed with the stuff that is fine. I am a learner, I am a teacher. Of every hue and cast I am I, of every rank and religion, a farmer, mechanic, artist, gentleman, sailor, Quaker, prisoner, fancy man, rowdy, lawyer, physician, priest. The pleasures of heaven are with me, and the pains of hell are with me. My faith is the greatest of faith and the least of faith. I hear and behold God in every object, yet understand God not in the least. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. I've chosen that line as the title for my talk today, a line that captures the fragmentation, the history, the complexity, the contradictions, not just of Walt Whitman or Bob Dylan or humanity in general or you and me specifically. I contain multitudes is the best one line explanation for a tiny strip of land, no more than 12,000 square miles, about the size of New Jersey, or put more approachable. A strip of land 
that would fit inside our own Florida panhandle from Pensacola to Tallahassee. Of course, I'm speaking of that piece of land that contained the state of Israel, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip. If ever a section of Earth's geography contained multitudes, peoples, religions, opinions, atrocities, beauty, bloodshed, and glory, it is this tiny slice of the world. I don't know if it's brave, as Anna said, but I am departing from my usual habit today, stepping away from the lectionary in an attempt to answer a few of the more pressing and urgent questions regarding the outbreak outbreak of war in Gaza and Israel. I've been overrun with questions, questions that are biblical in nature, historical, geographical, political, and apocalyptical. And I could talk and take on this subject for hours. I won't. So you can keep your brunch reservations. But I am going to talk a little longer than usual. And if you're here for the very first time today, you can almost put a a clock, a a watch on me, 23 minutes flat. I'll be done. It might take a little longer today, but covering 3,000 years of Jewish history should be allowed to take a few extra minutes. But more than history, I hope these few minutes will provide context for what we are witnessing today, something that we really haven't seen in 50 years. I have been guilty of perpetuating a lie, a lie that I've heard retold many times in the last few weeks. And it goes like this whenever there's conflict in the Middle East. Oh, those people over there have been killing each other for thousands of years. Have you heard that in the last few weeks? Have you said that in the last few weeks? Well, it's not true. It hasn't always been as it is today. And I'll rush to add, it's been far worse than it is today. Our story begins in that book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. The reading today from Genesis 17 is a reiteration of the promises God, Yahweh, made to Abraham. You will notice that the text also records his name change. Did you notice that? From Abram to Abraham. Abram is an old Mesopotamian name. And it means elevated father. Or exalted father. I'll show you that I have no shame and no couth whatsoever. The hillbilly rendering of Abram would be Big Daddy. It would. I'm going to write the redneck version of the Bible one day. Well, God amends that name. Abram becomes Abraham. From exalted father to the father of many. From big daddy to the granddaddy of them all. That's the name change that is made. All being the people of Israel. And in time... Arabs, and in time, Abraham would become the father to all of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Here is a man who contained multitudes. And I hope that you heard it in the text, that the multitudes were also multiple nations, multiple ethnic and cultural groups, and the intent was blessing and longevity, all living in the same land not killing one another and competing. And so it was. The Jewish people were planted in the center of the Levant, the Middle East, within the Rift Valley along the Mediterranean Sea. And some 3,000 years ago, David of Bethlehem, a shepherd, a warrior, an anointed king, united the 12 tribes of Israel for the first time since the Exodus. He took Jerusalem as his capital and established the nation state of Israel. The nation persevered in spite of attempted eradications, overcoming multiple colonizing attempts by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Syrians, and they remained more or less intact for a thousand years. We think our country is so old. A thousand years. The nation state of Israel did, though, come to an end. In 70 AD, a generation after Jesus While many of the first Christians were still living, Israel was wiped off the world's map. There were still Jews, but they are all scattered and dispersed 
all over Eastern Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. The temple was torn down except for the western foundational wall, which you can still see today. The monarchy was exterminated, and in 135 A.D., when the final remnants of the Jewish people rebelled one last time against the Romans, Emperor Hadrian recalled all his troops from Great Britain, marched on Jerusalem again, and killed 600,000 Jewish people. Adding insult to injury, he and his successors stopped using the names Israel and Judea in their official records. They were all struck from Roman records and they began using the word Syria Palestinia or simply Palestine. An invention of Roman vernacular that spoke about their victory over Judea and to spite the Jewish people. That name Palestine would endure until the 20th century and regain usage from the most interesting of places. And so it was for hundreds of years Surviving Jews led quiet lives. Christianity began to blossom and took root. Arabs, Christians, and Jews lived together side by side in the land of Syria, Palestinia, without major conflict for generations, quite literally for a thousand years. And even when a new faith arose, Islam and Jerusalem surrendered peacefully to Umar the Great in 637 A.D., Christians and Jews were granted freedom of religion and freedom of worship. All three faiths lived together. It wasn't utopia, but it was manageable. And it was peaceful. So we can see this story in three chapters. From David to Rome, a thousand years. From Rome to the First Crusade, another thousand years. And from the First Crusade until today, a third thousand years. In 1095, Pope Urban II saw an opportunity to retake the Holy Land from the Muslims. He raised an army by offering land and titles in the Middle East, loot and riches, and absolution of all sin, and immediate entry into heaven should anyone die fighting for the cause, sounding just like radicalized Islamic clerics today. Here's a portion of his sermon. The Turks and Arabs have destroyed our churches and devastated the empire of holy Jerusalem in which Christ himself suffered for us because our sins demanded it, has been reduced to the pollution of paganism. The holy sepulcher of the Lord our Savior is possessed by unclean nations, polluted now with their filthiness. The Lord will overwhelm us if you do not aid those who profess the Christian religion. To brandish your sword against these Turks. This is warfare of righteousness. All who die by the way or in battle against the pagans shall have immediate remission of sins. This I grant them through the power of God with which I am invested. And let this one war cry be raised by all the soldiers of God. This is the will of God. This is the leader of the Christian church. Not an Islamic leader that you might see on television today. And when one soldier asked his French commander, how can I tell the difference, next slide please, between the Christians and the Arabs, between the Jews and the Muslims, his commander answered, tu es les tu in French, which means kill them all, for God will know his own. And so for 200 years, that's exactly what happened. Christians marched on Jerusalem to repel The Muslims, only to have the Muslims march on Jerusalem and repel the Christians. East versus West. Europe versus the Middle East. Christianity versus Islam. Islam and Christianity versus the Jews. Ottomans versus the French and the English. Atrocity after atrocity. But again, stability returned. And for seven more centuries, religions and ethnic groups would coexist again. Until... There's always an until in this story. Until World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapsed and the British Petroleum Company discovered that the Middle East was the single greatest treasure trove of crude oil in the world. And now there was really something worth fighting for. The British and the French carved up what is today Israel along the same lines that the Crusaders had used 
And the British resurrected the old Roman name for the territory, Syria, Palestine. The French took Syria in the north, and the British took Palestine in the south. We know what followed, World War II, the Holocaust. In the aftermath of that atrocity, the single worst crime against humanity ever committed with the extermination of more than six million Jewish souls. There was an international outcry to provide a home for the Jewish people in their historically rooted land, a land that they had not possessed since 70 A.D. Thousands of Jews had been moving back over the centuries. Europe didn't want them anymore after everything that had happened. So in 1947, the United Nations passed a declaration creating three things, and I quote, an independent Arab state, an independent Jewish state, and the city of Jerusalem held under international trust. It was just two years after World War II, and those were great words on paper, but nobody had the will to commit any kind of force to implement the plan. The British withdrew on May 14, 1948. Israel declared its existence for the first time in 1,878 years, and all hell broke loose. Egypt, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen all declared war on Israel. And Israel survived. Barely. Decades of war would follow. The Palestinian insurgency, the Suez Crisis in Egypt, the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War, the Lebanese War. So yes, all those people in the Middle East have been trying to kill each other. But on the stage of world history, only for the last 75 years. And here is something else for you to consider. Almost every enemy that warred against Israel in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s are now at peace with Israel. The United Arab Emirates, Iran, Egypt, Jordan, Sudan, the PLO, Lebanon, every neighbor except Syria. And Israel has not been engaged in a shooting war with any other nation state since 1982. It's miraculous, really. And that brings us to the last few pages of this chapter. The one that is filling the headlines of today's news. This is a definite shooting war, a definite hot war with Gaza. But what's it all about? Who is right? Who is wrong? Why did this happen? Well, it contains multitudes. Gaza and the West Bank, map please. Gaza and the West Bank are territories adjacent to Israel that were originally designated as an Arab state back in 1947. The Palestinian leadership at the time felt that accepting a two-state solution was impossible. Not one inch would they give to Israel. A mistake that in hindsight would have saved thousands of lives. Then Israel proposed that Gaza, where there is so much conflict today, you'll love this one. Israel proposed that Gaza be given to Egypt in the 1970s when they made peace. And Egypt said, no way. Hamas is ungovernable. And when Israel made peace with Jordan 30 years ago, Israel offered the entire West Bank back to Jordan. And the king of Jordan said, no way. That would bankrupt our country and cause nothing but internal strife. So these two areas, Gaza and the West Bank, inhabited by people known as Palestinians, that Roman coin of phrase, to intentionally differentiate themselves from living in Israel proper or from living in another Arab country, have been abandoned by their Arab neighbors. They have been abandoned by the world. They have been left to fend for themselves, often living in what could be described as an open-air prison. These regions are boiling cauldrons of unrest. They are full and running over with young, uneducated, trapped populace, 50% of Gaza is under the age of 18. And they will never see another slice of this earth because they're not allowed to travel outside of that territory. And Israel's treatment of them is a history of contradiction. Efforts at peace, absolutely 
but also their own crimes of injustice and cruelty. It is complicated, and it is not an overstatement to say that this spot right here is the most difficult and thorny religious and geopolitical puzzle that exists on the face of the planet today. Bar none. So I'll finish with a few statements that I think are true. You know, when the pastor of my church used to say, I'll finish, that usually meant 45 more minutes. But I'm going to be a little quicker than that. These statements may sound contradictory. Sometimes they are. But I think that they can be held together, containing the multitudes within them. They can all be true at the same time. Number one. The Palestinian cause for self-rule, self-direction, and freedom is a legitimate one. Can you imagine, here's an example, can you imagine the outrage that would occur in this country if the United Nations showed up and said, we're going to place a group of dispossessed people who haven't really had a home in thousands of years, we're going to put them in the United States, and all we're going to do is just carve out a little of Georgia, uh, maybe a little bit of West Virginia, and we're going to settle those folks there. And, of course, the people that already live there are going to have to leave. We would burn the world to the ground. Gadsden flags would be flying off of every house and car from here to kingdom come because we would see it as an attack against our sovereignty. And there is no one in this country that could accept that. That's what the Palestinians in many ways have been up against. Number two, Hamas, who killed so many Israeli innocents in these recent days, has no interest in the Palestinian cause of self-rule, self-direction, or freedom whatsoever. Their ambition is to steal, to kill, and to destroy their one and only aim is the eradication of every Israeli living anywhere in the world. Hamas is a terrorist organization no different than ISIS, Al-Qaeda, or the Taliban. They are killing Israelis not in some act of liberation or revolution or by some convoluted means of achieving peace. They kill for the sake of killing and for the purpose of escalation. They invite further attacks. They want further attacks. They desire further attacks because their demented goal is to have the opportunity to kill even more Jews. And those who cheer Hamas on like they are some sort of freedom fighters are cheering on murderers as rank and as ideologically depraved as the Nazis. Hamas would murder those same supporters in the street if given half a chance. Number three, Gaza and Hamas are not the same thing. Well, Gaza, Gaza elected them. They did in 2007, and there has not been an election held since. And I remind you, 50% of the population is so young that the Hamas dictatorship is all they have ever known. Gaza is a collection of two million desperate people. Hamas is a manipulator of those people, drawing out their worst impulses. And do you know where Hamas's leaders live? In Qatar. In their fine palaces and on their expensive yachts, financing terror but never getting their hands dirty or taking any risk whatsoever themselves. Let's anger and stir up a demoralized 17-year-old boy. Let's buy him an AK-47. Let's teach him to be a suicide bomber. And Gaza suffers while Hamas's financiers simply order more champagne. I will quote Bob Dylan from a classic song in the 60s called Masters of War. You fasten the triggers for others to fire, then sit back and watch as the death count gets higher. You hide in your mansion as young people's blood flows out of their bodies and into the mud. Number four. There are leaders in the current Israeli government who directly propped up and supported Hamas. This is the hardest thing to hear. 
In 1995, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who I mentioned earlier, made peace with the PLO and Yasser Arafat. The end goal was to create that two-state solution. Those in power today incited anger and disinformation and fear and violence, and they encouraged Hamas to do the same thing on their side of the fence. And within weeks, Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated by one of his own, an Israeli who would not give peace a chance. And at the next election cycle, Israel elected one of those fear mongers as its prime minister, one of the very people who is still in power today. They want extremism to remain in place, just as many all over the world want to, because it keeps them in power. In terrifying contradiction, Israel has been both the killer of their enemy and their enemy's accomplice. Five, Israel will defend itself. But let us pray that self-defense does not turn into atrocity. What Hamas has done, the evil it has committed, was done to draw Israel into war and to stop normalization of Israel's relationship with Saudi Arabia. Israel was about to sign its first peace treaty ever with Saudi Arabia. That's why this is happening now. Every time an effort is made toward peace, someone radical wants to call it back to violence. And this is going to lead to more killing, to more and more violence. Hamas has intentionally set back peace efforts for decades, for generations, and thousands of Palestinian and Israeli innocents will die. No matter what your view of war is, whether you're a peacenik or a war hawk, nobody's children should be killed. No grandmother should be executed with a shot to the back of her head or her apartment building bombed into the dust. But I fear that self-defense will turn into extermination on both sides, an opportunity to settle every bad score since 1948. Six, and I'm almost done. This is not the end of the world. Okay? Don't you fall for that. There's a strain of American evangelicalism that holds Israel as the nation, not necessarily the actual Jewish people, as being above critique. Well, they're God's chosen people, so whatever they do is right. No, it's not right. We should support Israel. They are our brothers and sisters, but we can't support every action that they take. You'll understand it this way. Mark Twain said this, patriotism is supporting your country all the time and your government when they deserve it. Israel is not morally superior simply because they are Israel. Read the Old Testament prophets for a different perspective on that one. And contrary to what a few dispensational teachers over the last 150 years have said and succeeded in making a majority opinion within Christian circles, what happens in Israel does not necessarily mean anything about the apocalypse, the return of Jesus, the building of a third temple, or anything else. This is not the end of the world. Why? We aren't that lucky. Anybody know, remember the, the southern comedian Jerry Clower? The story of John up in the woods. He thought it was a raccoon. It's actually a souped up wildcat. And there, John and the souped up wildcat are fighting up in the woods. And they don't know what to do. And John yells down and says, just shoot up in here amongst us. One of us has got to have some relief. Well, if the world would end, we would all probably breathe a sigh of relief. It's not likely to happen. We forget, because our memories are short, that crises far more dangerous and upending have occurred before this one. And to fall into the apocalyptic rabbit hole is to succumb to the very same fear being fomented in and around the Middle East today. It is to fall into every cycle of violence in that region for the last 2,000 years. Don't take that bait. If you do, you'll be watching TV preachers at 2 in the morning, stockpiling baked beans, and trading assets for gold bars. Just simmer down. Just simmer down. And seven. (laughs) It's not the end of the world, but it will be for many people. If people of all faith, people of goodwill, 
abandon the work of finding a just peace. If you say to yourself, well, that's just something that's happening 6,000 miles away. Well, God help us all. I have Israeli friends. A couple that are on the border with Gaza right now. I love them. They are my friends. In the West Bank, I have Palestinian friends. I love them. They are my friends. Do I take sides with one set of friends over the other? <laughs> no. They're my friends. I pray for their safety. All of their safety. It's a Stevie Wonder song that goes through my mind. Now I lay me down to sleep. In a troubled world, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And keep the hatred from the mighty. And keep the mighty from the small. Heaven help us all. I hope Hamas falls quickly for the sake of everyone. I hope Israel can stop pushing Palestinians into smaller and smaller areas with higher and higher fences for the sake of everyone. I hope the Palestinian people will see that Hamas or any other radical government offers them no solutions and that a grassroots, moral, compassionate, and wise generation of new leadership can emerge for the sake of everyone. I hope Israel will ultimately stand on the break and cross whatever finish line in their defense operation that they can find for the sake of everyone. I hope that people who are talking about this conflict, myself included, will speak from a place of knowledge and historical context, compassionate wisdom and humility, not from impulse or vengeance or ignorance or arrogance or just repeat what someone else has told them for the sake of everyone. I've been involved with and I follow many who work for a just peace between Israel and Palestine. We are Christians, we are Jews, we are Muslims, we are Americans, we are Israelis, we are Palestinians, we are mullahs, pastors, rabbis, and ethicists. And now more than ever, we must commit to just peace. That means you name the injustices, you propose solutions, you take the side of the vulnerable and the voiceless, you keep talking, you stay at the table. You keep praying, you keep crying, you keep going. No, the people over there have not been killing each other for thousands of years. In the last 30 minutes, I just gave you a crash course in 3,000 years of Jewish history related to the land of Palestine. And in those 3,000 years, there have been 275 years of combat. And 200 of those were the Crusades, and the Jews were not even involved. So let us not lose hope. Let us not grow fatalistic. Let us join all who seek justice and peace. Let us partner with every son and daughter of Abraham that this land shared by family will bloom once again like a garden in the desert. May this land be large, containing multitudes of growing, thriving, freedom-loving, God-honoring people, no matter which border they find themselves within. This is the traditional rabbinical prayer drafted and printed in 1948 when the nation of Israel was established. May we pray it together. Our Father who is in heaven, protector and redeemer of Israel, shield us beneath the wings of your love. Spread over us your canopy of peace. Send your light and your truth to our leaders, officers, and counselors, and direct them with your good counsel. Strengthen and establish peace in the Holy Land, and everlasting joy for its inhabitants. Unite all hearts to love and revere your name. Shine forth in your glorious majesty over all the inhabitants of your world, let everything that breathes proclaim, the Lord God is King, His majesty rules.
And that wouldn't be a bad prayer for our own conflicted country.